Greetings, everybody. How you doing? This is Joe Driscoll back with my podcast, Salt City Grind. Uh, for those of you who are watching, um, you know, we did a lot of episodes throughout the early stages of the lockdown. And then as the warmer weather kicked in and people were outside, I, I took a little hiatus to kind of, uh, you know, let it breathe for a little bit. Uh, now we're back with my friend Sally Roche Wagner. Um, but before we get to that, just want to announce that we got um, – We've really done a lot of work building the infrastructure around the pod the podcast. If you want to look, we have a website up, www.saltcitygrind.com. Um, you can subscribe on YouTube, Apple, uh, Spotify. There's loads of different ways to subscribe to the podcast, so you don't have to keep an eye out for when we do them live. You can just get updates on when we post a new episode. Um, so really psyched about the, the website, once again, saltcitygrind.com, and you can get all the past episodes, uh, catch them on YouTube or all that stuff. So just a little housekeeping um, to start out the episode. And uh, with that, I'll bring on my guest, uh, my first guest back, Sally Roche Wagner. Hey, Sally, Joe, how's it going? Good to see uh, you. So good to see you. How's everything? Are you all right at the moment? What's new? I'm great. I'm I'm staying in. Went for a walk today. Started out when it was sunny. Ended up walking into hail, which turned rapidly into snow. <laughs> Welcome to Salt City. <laughs> there you go. Love it. So, uh, you know, having you on, I you know, I had I was in two frames of mind. One was like I, at first I was like, well, Sally and I can just shoot the breeze for hours with no. Uh, with no problem, <laughs> certainly. We have a lot of great sessions. Even when uh, we're not on my back porch, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Wherever we happen to, uh, to to begin the conversation, it, it always goes smashingly. But then I had a moment of panic where I was like, oh, well, there's so many topics I could talk to Sally about. Um, you know, I want to make sure I, I, I hit my targets. But Ultimately, I think you know, just uh, just enjoying each other's company and, and shooting the breeze will 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 do just fine. So, um, for those who are unfamiliar with your work, um, maybe give like a little, you know, background. Um, you know, the field you're in, how you got into it, how it all started. Uh, you know, with your studies and, and your work as an author. You know, some of that I know you well, but for those that don't, um, you know, what's what's a, a quick background of, of what you do and, and how you came upon that that path in life? You know, I, I think I just fell into one thing after another. I have no career. I have a calling. And I just sort of do whatever <laughs> brings me joy. So you know, where does it start? I, I married, got pregnant right out of high school, had to get married, had two kids, was a suburban housewife, and then I went rogue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I ended up in the anti-war movement, and that led to the women's rights movement and um, ended up uh, being part of the foundation, the forming of the first women's studies program in the country to offer a minor. We were, I think, the third program. I taught my first women's studies class 50 years ago. I, I, I worry that like somebody's going to come along and bronze me and put me up on a mantle somewhere. <laughs> you know, you, you do it this long, but I still teach at SU and I love it. I'm finishing up a class on um, activism in the 60s, sex, drugs, mm -hmm. and rock and roll is the title <laughs> of the course. For some reason, it fills very quickly. <laughs> so <Brilliant>. then, <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying brilliant, brilliant. Oh, uh, it's so fun. So then I, um, I fell in love with a dead woman. And that was in 1973. And we've been in a hot relationship ever since. Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And one thing leads to another, you know, I end up writing about her, I end up doing books about her. 
And then I try to figure out, like, how did she get such a transformational vision? She was equally important with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They were the triumvirate of leadership of the National Woman Suffrage Association. Uh, Gage was president one year. Anthony was president one year. Uh, Stanton was president because she didn't like to do any of the work <laughs> for most of the time. Gage ran the National Woman Suffrage Association and edited the official newspaper from her home in Fayetteville. And mm -hmm. it's one of the most important historic homes, women's rights historic homes. There's so much history was made there. So then I'm trying to find out how, how did she get such a transformational vision? Because she wasn't talking about equality. And this is at a time when married women were considered dead in the law. They just, they didn't exist when she married. So how did she get an idea of a world in harmony and balance? She's envisioning the end of patriarchy in 1893. Where does this come from? That led me to the Haudenosaunee influence because that's where she saw the world that she wanted to create in her own Euro-American world. That's, that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the short version. That's the cliff notes <laughs> of my life. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get into some of them. So, um, you know, with her, uh, with her work with, you know, I, I feel like before I met you, I was, you know, I'd heard Elizabeth Cady Stanton and I'd heard about Susan B. Anthony. And I'd heard about a lot of the folks who were involved in the movement, but it feels like Matilda was kind of um, not included in the history books as much for at least in the, the official version that I got in, in my elementary school years. Uh, she wasn't mentioned very much. So maybe you could go into, you know, as you said, these were kind of the triumvirate. These three, these three women kind of spearheaded the charge in a lot of ways. And why is it that we, you know, in your opinion that we have, uh, we hear Elizabeth and, and Susan's name mentioned so frequently, but not Matilda's? Well, <clears throat> how did I fall in love with this dead woman? That's the key to the answer. My mother had a friend named Matilda Gage. A colleague of mine came across the name Matilda Gage in connection with my hometown of Aberdeen, South Dakota. And she said, there was this really important woman named Matilda Gage. And I called up my mom and said, your friend's pretty old, but she's not that old, is she? Involved in the suffrage movement. And my mom said, oh, that was her grandma. She was this really important woman. And my mom goes on and on. I said, how do you know all this? Well, she performed in a skit with Matilda Jewel Gage, the granddaughter and the namesake. And my mom played Susan B. Anthony and Matilda played her grandmother. And uh, so I said, how come you never told me this? Long silence. You never ask. Moral of the story is ask. <laughs> so I go to visit Matilda in the summer, July of 1973. And I think I, I'm really not interested at all in that at that point in my life in the suffrage movement. I mean, as a radical feminist, we were on the streets, you know, we were demanding. And what I had was the story I bet you got of these teacup ladies who say, who ask for the vote for 72 years, you know, nah, I'm not interested. They got nothing to tell me. So I walk into Matilda's house and she takes me into her dining room where she has Matilda Jocelyn Gage's papers piled high and it's letters, it's, it's scrapbooks, it's photo albums, it's published and unpublished manuscripts. So I start reading the letters. I mean, this is kind of interesting. One of the first letters I came across is, um, she says, I will have, she's her books come out woman, church and state. This thing is hot. This thing is so important. Mm -hmm. um, so she um, she says, I will not allow the names of Stanton and Anthony to be used in any way in publicity for my book. 
Susan B. Anthony has stolen from me in money and reputation. And I consider Mrs. Stanton as the Benedict Arnold of our movement. I got hooked. <laughs> What's the answer? How did she steal from her in money and reputation? In money, she withholds money that Matilda Jocelyn Gage should have had for the editing of the three volumes that the three women did, History of Women's Suffrage. Anthony doesn't give her the money that she's due. And mm -hmm. Stanton, I think, threatened to sue Anthony over that. Wow. So then the stealing in reputation, she wrote Gage out of history and it wasn't her alone. But what happened was that Stanton and Gage, they said, yeah, the vote, uh, Stanton said it's half a loaf. It's not even half a loaf. It's a crumb, she said. And then Stanton and Gage wrote, the vote is simply a tool to lift the fourfold oppression of women at the hands of the church, the family, the capitalist, and the state. This is in the 80s. So Anthony, at the same time, wants the vote. That's all she wants to focus on. So here are these, you know, three women working together. Two of them think the vote's like, nah, it'll, it'll, you know, it's not a big deal. It's a tool, that's all. Anthony, it's an end in itself. Anthony wants to bring together the two women's rights organizations. The other one's much more conservative than theirs. She engineers a merger. She brings in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And what they want to do is to put religion in the government. They want to destroy the wall of separation of church and state. And Gage says that's the greatest danger of the hour. You know, if we lose religious freedom in this country, it's not going to matter who votes. And right. so right. she opposes the merger, is unable to stop it. And so she goes off to form her own organization to fight for the separation of church and state, maintaining that. Mm -hmm. And the merged organization gets more and more conservative. They end up um, becoming, you know, a, a pseudo Christian organization. I don't know if that's even, that may be an overstatement, but they're certainly very Christian friendly having ministers as presidents right. and to start practicing racism as policy to win the amendment in the South. They make the argument, give women the vote because white women outnumber Negroes and immigrants and women's mm -hmm. suffrage is a way to maintain white native born supremacy. Mm -hmm. Now, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who in the previous decades has written about the superior position of Haudenosaunee women, of Native women. And here's a, you know, an organization practicing racism or practicing racism. And here's also Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who is saying the foundation of women's oppression is the Christian church. This is my friend. Hey, say hi. <laughs> Hey, yeah. hi to Joe. That's <laughs> Baba. So, um, so you know, they they're not going to want this woman to be remembered, and that's the longer story of she gets written out of history. So it right, wasn't a right. chance that you didn't read about her. Nobody read about her, and the I guess the work of my life has been to bring her back into history. Yeah, and I'm I'm incredibly grateful for it. It's been really fascinating. I think I first saw you at Thursday Morning Roundtable, I believe it that's was. That's right. That's where we met. And you presented, and I was just absolutely floored by it. And kind of from my own experiences, um, you know, it it's um, it's it's in many ways not surprising, you know, um, that this is this is the way that history evolves. You know, that so often those that are there for the credit aren't the ones that that really did a lot of the shoveling early on you know uh, so but maybe you and, could talk yeah sorry go ahead oh uh, i just was going to say that i i remember that meeting so well because i was so impressed when i met you i thought 
this is the spirit of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And everything you've done since then has let me know that was a true instinct immediately. Uh, I, and I've I've really related to everything I've read about her and, and, and seen, you know, it's really, really been amazing. So maybe you could go into something I never really talked to you too much about. How did Matilda Jocelyn Gage end up with this connection with the Haudenosaunee people and, and you know, and, and how did that evolve? And, you know, maybe give us some insight into, uh, you know, how she took so much from um, Haudenosaunee culture and, and, you know, what the influence was and some of what those experiences were and, and some of her writings on, on you know, living with them and, and getting to know them better. You know, I think that... Um there's a couple things with that. One is that our prejudices keep us from seeing things that are right in front of our eyes. And because the, the, the standard Christian interpretation of native people in the 19th century was they were, they were savages, they were heathens and Gage, I think, because she had gotten away from Christian exceptionalism, was able to see a superior culture. She said, never was justice more perfect, never was civilization higher. I know that she attended ceremony. She was invited to ceremony at Onondaga. Um, and she writes about that with some understanding and some not understanding, which I can empathize with because I realize that I have some level of understanding and some level of not understanding. Um, as, as generous as my Haudenosaunee friends have been in schooling me. But I think that the other answer is that if you would have picked up the post standard, it was then the standard, um, a hundred years ago, you would have read about a chief at Onondaga uh, passing and there being a condolence ceremony to install the new chief. Now, it was these stories were written as though, like you would write about the inauguration of the president. The assumption is people know what a president is when they're reading the newspaper article. They know what a president is. They know what inauguration is. They know how the process goes to bring the president into authority. That's how the standard wrote articles about the Haudenosaunee with the, with the level of understanding that is really limited to scholars. Of course, native people know, but, but non-native people, it's really limited to scholars. That indicates a huge connection between native and non-native people. And that makes perfect sense. You know, here are these settler colonialists that are moving into a territory, an area that is occupied by people who have the oldest continuing democracy in the world. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think, the whole way in which we've understood our history, like the party doesn't start till we get here, you know, sure. not native people. Well, party was going on, has been going on for a thousand years. The shores of Onondaga Lake, the founding of the Confederacy. And so the level of understanding that you and I would have had living here a hundred years ago, just, so far superior to what what people have generally today, non-native people. And so part of it is she was part of the knowledge base. People being given honorary adoptions like she was given was not uncommon. Mm. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's in closest neighbor in Seneca Falls had been, um, he, he had a trading post at Onondaga and he was given an honorary adoption. And the newspaper say, said when his, when his um, Onondaga relatives came through, they would stay with him. You know, the, there was, it wasn't like you were three people removed from, you knew somebody. Right. And so 
there's that. There's also her support. President of the National Women Suffrage Association in, in 1875, she writes a series of front page articles in the uh, New York Evening Post. And she, uh, the editor of the paper introduces the first one saying, it's only appropriate that the, um, the president of the women's rights organization is writing about the superior position of, of Indian women. So she supports the chiefs uh, who gather in council at Onondaga in 1878, three years later, when the state of New York is thinking about um, a law that would give Indian men citizenship. And mm. they say, absolutely not. And Gage writes in the official woman suffrage paper that she's editing here in Syracuse. And she writes, um, the chiefs are... Uh, the chiefs met at Onondaga as they have since before Columbus. And this was their decision. And she said, it's the greatest hypocrisy that the government is trying to force citizenship on Indian men, the mm. better to steal their lands while it's denying it to um, the women who are citizens and demanding the vote. And then she goes on to talk about how they're sovereign nations, every bit as much as, Canada and Mexico and to force citizenship on, on a native nation men is like forcing it on Canadians and Mexicans. And it just goes on and on and on. You know, she ends up having an honorary adoption into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation in 1893. And her, uh, she writes to her daughter that her, her Mohawk sister is considering her for a voice in the Council of Matrons give her a voice in political affairs. And she's arrested the same year for voting in Fayetteville. And, <laughs> and so, you know. Amazing. What was her, so what was her, um, what was her personal story like? You know, you keep saying, you know, the, the time frame of, you know, mid 19th century into, into the late 19th century. And obviously, I mean, this, the stuff she was doing would, would certainly be considered rebellious today. Um, and I can only imagine what was it back then? How did, you know, how did her, uh, you know, her, I don't know if she ever married or if she had, you know, she had partners or, you know, how did they respond to this, this wild spirit and this rebellious <laughs> thing that she was doing? Yeah. Yeah. She, um, you know, she says the greatest lesson of her life was given to her by her father who taught her to think for herself. And when she was 10, she went up against the church fathers. And I, I don't know what the issue was, but her dad had her back. And, <laughs> and um, she was invited. It, their home was a station on the Underground Railroad in Cicero. And, and when there would be all these radical reform meetings, you know, abolition, um, her father practiced children's rights, you know, and women's rights, there would have been discussions of probably as well, because there was beginning to be stirrings of that in her childhood. So she was, she was a part of all those discussions. And her father made sure that she was a participant so that, you know, how it happens with kids, they'll say something and the adults will just right up, you know, talk right over him like they didn't say anything. He would interrupt, you know, Matilda said something. But it, <laughs> so she ends up marrying this really gentle man, Henry Gage. He has a, a store in Cicero, then Syracuse, then Manlius, then Fayetteville. They move those places and then end up in Fayetteville um, in, in uh, 1854. They're very simpatico in terms of their politics. Both strong abolitionists offer their home as a station on the Underground Railroad. And Henry's letters are all full of these emotional, you know, deep emotions and to their kids. And Matilda's are, now if you're sick, do this homeopathic remedy. And I was in Washington at the convention and Mrs. Gage or Mrs. Stanton and Susan B and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's all this, it's interspersed 
but it's all very, hmm, how would I say, just very practical. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> there's a couple of stories about Henry that are fun. One of them is um, she had a, <clears throat> what Matilda Jewel Gage told me was the Jocelyn temper, quick to anger, quick to forgive. But Henry was, <laughs> he did the silent treatment. And so he was upset about something and he wasn't, he wasn't talking to her and it was apparently driving her nuts. And so he's sitting in the parlor, probably reading the paper or something. And she comes in and she gets down on her hands and knees and she's like looking underneath tables. She's looking underneath chairs. She's like, you know, clearly looking for something. Finally, his curiosity gets the best of him. And he says, what are you looking for? And she says, your tongue, you seem to have lost it. <laughs> I thought that was a great action. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Direct action gets him out. So, yeah, another time he comes home and she's having a women's rights meeting. And he's really tired. And he just goes in and, and goes to bed. And the bed was on the first floor, the bedroom where he was, you know, where he went in to sleep. And he goes in there and, and um, the women have put their coats and their hats and, you know, on the bed. And he just crawls in underneath that. And Matilda is saying goodbye to the people at the front door as they're leaving. And all of a sudden there's a shriek that comes out of the bedroom. And this woman screams, there's a man in this bed. Apparently she just lifted up her coat and uncovered Henry sound asleep. So he adjusted. You know, what can I say? He adjusted to who she was. Oh, God bless him. You know? <laughs> So how did it go? How did it go after the, you know, after the split, you know, with um, between Susan and Elizabeth and Jocelyn? I mean, did um, was there animosity three ways? Did Susan and Elizabeth stay close? Was Matilda kind of on her own? How did it go after Susan went with um. her back to say, you know, preserving the white majority became her after, you know, after all... Matilda's work with, you know, like you said, with the railroad, with the Haudenosaunee and, and you know, her real kind of, um, you know, seemingly, um, you know, enlightened view of, of, of race and culture uh, to have Susan go on this. What, what was the what was the dynamic between the three after that? Yeah. that what happened? That's a really good question. Um, Susan B. Anthony forbade people to attend Matilda's convention, uh, the founding convention of the National Women's Liberal Union, her, the organization she formed to fight for f religious freedom, you know, freedom from encroachment in government. And she brought together all the progressives of the age, anarchists, um, Voltaire Declare, she brought uh, prison reformers, um, um, capital punishment reformers. I mean, it was, you know, it was a, it was a good rainbow coalition, I think in some ways, but, um, but Anthony, first of all, just like, you know, can't even attend. And um, then, and what happened was that uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had said to Matilda, you know, our, our most important work is ahead of us, and it's really fighting the church. It's really fighting that Christian orthodoxy that says that women are to be under the authority of men because of the sin of Eve. You know, that started it all. That then becomes common law, and that's why women are considered dead in the law. So they're going to go after it. And, and then, and, and, Stanton's going to be part of Gage's organization, you know, the, the one that would make sense to her. And then Susan B. Anthony dangles a carrot in front of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's nose. And Stanton is vain. Stanton is also, I think, still angry at 
some of the reasons for the split between the two women's organizations initially forming separately. And Anthony says, you should be the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And Stanton accepts it. And that's why Gage really felt she was the Benedict Arnold. But quick to anger, quick to forgive, 1895, Susan or Elizabeth Cady Stanton comes knocking at the door and let's do a woman's Bible together. And they do. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton takes it out, the copyright in her name alone. <laughs> Once again, Gage gets done in. But she goes on to work with her on the second volume of the woman's of the woman's Bible too. Mm. I guess she just felt that the work was more important than the credit or some such. I think you got it. I think that's exactly it, Joe. Yeah. Oh. Tragic in so many ways. I mean, great in so many ways, but you know, it, it still uh, ruffles my tail feathers, you know, it still, still upsets me that, that she didn't. So, I guess I would, I would, um, you know, the, the other, some of the other things I was thinking about, um, you know, you've also, you know, we, we're talking a lot about Matilda, which was, you know, uh, definitely what I, you know, um, how, how we first met and, and still fascinates me tremendously, you know, the whole legacy of that, but also, you know, your, your, um, your years of teaching and, and women's studies and, and all the work you've done, I guess, you know, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, contemporary stuff. We were just, just yesterday, something came up. My wife and I were watching The Crown, um, yeah. you know, that British show, and and um, been watching it. It's good, right? Yeah, yeah. But we just had the introduction of of Margaret Thatcher um, in, in in the last episode. I haven't got so far. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Margaret Thatcher, you know, eventually enters the scene and. And my wife was just kind of saying, you know, isn't it amazing that the Brits were able to elect a, a woman prime minister in the 70s? And it seems that, you know, America is still is still not ready. And, you know, it's not only just the presidential, but if you look at representation in, in politics, you know, it's not until very recently um, that, you know, we, we've seen more women getting into the fray with politics and and in, in uh, representation. So I guess I would just wonder, you know, um, you know, as we talked about, you know, originally with Matilda's uh, assessment about the Haudenosaunee and how the women, you know, had such a major role in, in the structure of life in that society. And, you know, in America, it's kind of, um, you know, uh, understood and, and just, you know, accepted that, you know, we are the, the, the uh, prime example and, and the best in everything that that exists out there. And uh, it just kind of, you know, after living in Europe for all those years and seeing that a, a lot of European countries have, you know, women that have have uh, risen throughout the, their senates and, and versions of Congress and, and, you know, their prime ministers and their presidents. I was curious what your thoughts are about, you know, where America fits in and, and you know, how we're doing and, uh, you know, what your thoughts are about, you know, women in, in American politics in particularly. We're a joke in the eyes of the world. You know, we're an embarrassment. I, I, we are so far behind every other industrialized nation in every single measurement. I mean, you take everything from our maternal and, and infant mortality rates to our childcare, to the percentage of representation, uh, you know, it's, you name an area and we're in the toilet. And, um, you know, when I, when I get so irate about it, it's like, I think I'm channeling Matilda who is saying, what is wrong with you people? How could you do this? In 1884, I was an elector at large on Belleville Lockwood's presidential ticket. Right. The Equal Rights Party. Belleville Lockwood ran for president in 1884. She got the entire electoral vote of, um, what was it, Indiana. 
Gage was an elector at large. You know, Victoria Woodhull announced her candidacy in 70, 1872. It's just, it, I don't know. I get I get so angry that I that I cannot even be articulate, and I think I'm angry as much at our arrogance about it as I am about our failure. You know mm -hmm. that that it's one thing to just say, "Yep, we suck." It's another thing to say we're the model for the world when the world is laughing not even behind our backs. They're laughing in our face now. And the embarrassment of the man that sat in the White House for four years. You know, if anything, we we have just lost our credibility in the world. And it was well-deserved. Losing it was well-deserved. Yeah, it, so was, it wasn't just the rapist in the White House. It was, and I just did say that on your podcast. That's the first time I've said that. I read it today. Somebody tweeted that, and it was like, "Yeah, let's just let's just name it for what it is." Um, so it isn't just him. It's it's the it's the enabling that we've done with our arrogance and our failures. Hmm. We're about to claim democracy in a, new, in, a, in a newer form, in a better form. We don't have a democracy, but hopefully we are on the road to creating another piece of it. Mm. So what's your, I, I was curious, I, I also was wondering about, um, did you see the show Miss America, uh, or was it Mrs. America, the, the Hulu show? Um, it was, it was going into, you know, the whole era of, uh, yeah. you know, Gloria Steinem and, and, I um, I and, 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 I and Shirley. Yeah. I'd be curious and, and, why I didn't watch it because I read Gloria's comments about it, that it was, it was, it was the lie of history that history is made by individuals and it's mm. not, it's made by movements and mm. that kind of history enrages me. And I, I chose not to watch. I know I need to, but here I got to tell you what, what I think is going to happen. One of the things that I'm really going to be, um, sort of pushing it came out of a meeting with the scholars that are on the advisory account uh, council of the national women's history museum. And I'm on that. And one of the things we were talking about was that the next, the, the, um, this whole next decade is the 50th anniversary of the real booming of the second wave of feminism. You know, 71 is the first uh, equal rights demonstration march. The first one for, I'm sorry, equal pay. The 70, 70, 1972 was the first big, huge women's march. And every year there is another event or more that is the 50th anniversary of. So I think that this next decade is gonna be really interesting in terms of, of looking at um, the next, um, you know, the 50 years that we've, that we'll be celebrating. Yeah, so what's, what's your, um, I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of, how to say it, it it's, it's, a lot of times you get questions like this and they're, they're kind of um, hard to put in a jar, you know, but how do you feel, you know, uh, kind of postmortem looking at, you know, the seventies and the movement that happened and, and how that, how that wrapped up and, and, you know, have we gone, uh, you know, it feels like we've gone backwards rapidly uh, in, in the last few years. Um, but, 
Uh, before that, you know, how do you feel about where we stood in, in 1970 and where we stood in 1980 and, and, and where we stand today as far as, you know, getting to equal pay and getting to, you know, getting to a more equitable society? What are your thoughts about, you know, um, the impact that that era had and, and how it's played out over time? You know, I, I think the revolutionary two-step you know, two steps forward and one back. Mm, yeah. Um, the backlash of the 80s was a symbol of how far we'd gone, of what mm -hmm. success we'd had. And I think, you know, I, I think history and, and maybe, maybe a, a way of looking and thinking is both and rather than either or. And I see the last four years as a both and. Donald Trump is the best organizer I have ever experienced. He organized resistance in a way that nobody has in my lifetime. Um, and that's the energy that we have moving forward. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say thanks, Don on your way out, but, <laughs> but I think that's been the result. Um, my experience of where we are now, even before the election, um, was that I, I felt more hopeful, even though things have been very bleak. I realized that I felt much more hopeful than I did in the 60s. And it really, I thought a lot about it in teaching this class on the 60s, that we were in the minority. I, I should, oh man, I should have brought it. I should have brought it in. I didn't think to. Um, one of the things, I'm, I'm going to circle a little bit, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no fear. You okay with it? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. oh, so one of the things that I use as a text in the class is my FBI file, excerpts from my FBI file that I got through the Freedom of Information Act. And it's, and it's uh, for my work in the anti-war movement, but there's also a little bit about the women's rights movement too. It just goes uh, to, I think about 1975. And then when I went off to graduate school, they decided they weren't going to follow me anymore. That's so I was kind of disappointed to find out. But anyway, the pride of my life is in this FBI file. There's a form letter signed by J. Edgar Hoover. And it's like, how dangerous is this person? And J. Edgar Hoover identified me as a potentially dangerous person. <laughs> and I have tried my best to live up to his expectations of me, but I don't think I have done as much as I should have. I hope I haven't disappointed him. Anyway, the, the thing that I feel is that we were so in the minority then you know, those of us who are pushing social justice and, and you know, the, the degree to which everything that I cared about and wanted, we were in the minority. Now, everything that I care about and want, we're in the majority. Hmm. We need to translate that into the government and into action. And with people like Joe Driscoll representing us, <laughs> I sleep better at night. Uh, I, I I hope to uh, to live up to that, you know, and and uh, also while remaining a potentially dangerous person myself, you know. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff. Well, so I, I I um you know I I let you know that I I've been really inspired by your sign off quote. Um, so when, when I got an email from you, it had your, uh, your sign off was uh, a Matilda quote, Matilda Jocelyn Gage quote, a rebel, how glorious the name sounds when applied to woman. Oh, rebellious woman, to you the world looks in hope. Upon you has fallen the glorious task of bringing liberty to the earth and all the inhabitants thereof. 
I just love that one. So why, why does that particular quote resonate with you so much from Matilda? And, and you know, why have you chosen it as your as your sign off when you when you send out emails? Why do you think, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. You know, the other thing I love about it is that it resonates for me on on different levels and one of them is that you know i think about the the haudenosaunee women that i take um that i look to for leadership um the uh, let's face it we're we're facing the possibility of the end of life on this planet mm. and we in the western tradition don't have an answer you know we we turn we turn our relatives into commodities, you know, um, and the idea that we are all related, all life is related, it's interrelated, that's scientifically true, that's spiritually valid, that's, you know, I mean, you name a dimension, that is essence. And that's a world that Native people, Indigenous people occupy. That's the, the way in which they live in the world. And at the heart of it, I really understand through my Haudenosaunee women mentors, friends, um, at the heart of it is that the, the spiritual heart, the spiritual essence of life is woman. That the creators of life are women and mother earth. Women create life have the potential to, and Mother Earth creates and provides us with everything that we need for the daily existence of food and shelter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's that's the essence of reality. And when you, when you violate either of those, you're you're heading to the end of the world. You're heading to the end of, not the planet, but you're heading to the end of life on the planet. The bees go, we go. Right. You know, it's as simple as that. And so, um, you know, I think it resonates with me because it looks to women for the leadership that we have to have. Mm to move us from where we are. I mean, it, right now, if you look at all the nations in the earth that are, that are working well with COVID, that have the best, the best rates right now, who runs them? Who's the head of the government? Women, every one of them. And when the financial, the last financial crisis happened, you know who recovered really well and fast? Iceland, women. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the proof's in the pudding. And the, the, some of the women that I really look to for leadership um, are, are talking about rematriation, that we need to not just indigenize all of us. You know, we need to, we need to learn a way of understanding that is indigenous that is relational mm -hmm. and but at the heart of it is the the primacy of women and mm -hmm. so i like that quote because it feels to me to be to work both in my culture and in my uh indigenous women friends culture as well yeah, that was exactly what I was looking for. You know, when I asked you the question, you were like, well, what do you think? And I, I felt a little silly. For that. <laughs> no, I mean, there's the obvious, you know, there's the obvious, yeah. but then there's, you know, the other as well, I guess. And it I have, you know, I never thought about that, Joe, until you ask it. Good. A, a good question is an extraordinary gift. Thank you. <laughs> it it uh, it really resonated with me and I wasn't, you know, and I hadn't articulated why it resonated with me so much as well. Um, but like I said, it, it it really has. And I think, you know, what you were saying was 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 really um, you know, went a ways to explain why. So when you when you talk about, you know, this uh you know, bringing back an indigenous kind of mindset, um, 
you know, what does that include for you as, as we look, you know, as we look to the future? I, and just an aside, as you said, you know, um, not the end of the planet, you know, um, I often think of the, of the George Carlin joke, you know, that um, I, I don't know if you remember that George Carlin joke, but he basically said, you know, um, we're not saving the planet. We're saving ourselves. Uh, the planet's going to be fine. I mean, if you have plastic, you know, filling every river, the river's going to just be a river with plastic in it. The only thing that's going to change is we're not going to be able to live and we're not going to be able to drink it, you know. And so the if it becomes the world with, you know, with with plastic or with with toxins or any of the stuff that we put in there, the earth will be the earth will continue on. We will be so. I often like to, to 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 bring that joke up just because it Hi. does point to, it does point to um, you know often we think of uh, you know a conservation effort as a completely altruistic effort and that's what you know uh, enables a lot of people to ignore it and say well, well whatever you know we'll be okay and it's like no this isn't for the planet it, it's you know as much as I, I do feel that altruistic love that I just want to see the planet, you know, regenerate and be in good health and in good balance and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's important that they remember that it's it's our survival that that is is really at stake. But but what would you think, you know, as I heard you mention that, you know, an indigenous mindset, what is what does that look like? What does that mean to you when you, when you say that kind of, you know, we have to uh, incorporate some of that into, you know, to, to try to get out of the quandary that we're in right now? You know, I, I, there's a couple of things I'm thinking about when I stuck my tongue out, when you said Margaret Thatcher, you know, it's because it's because I, I, for me, I remember the point in, 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 women's liberation when we were looking at biological supremacy and it was like is the is the worst woman better than the best man you know? <laughs> and yeah. there's an obvious answer there you know <laughs> there is a margaret thatcher that is <laughs> is that falls on the spectrum of female and then there is the new vice president of the United States. Right. Those are two way different commodities. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and so when I talk about the rematriation, as I understand it, it's, you know, it's recognizing the basic essentials of survival and recognizing where those are held. And they're held in my body and they're held in Mother Earth's body. And, and men who understand that and respect that, like you, are the, are the, the partners, the allies, the, the moving forward together. And Margaret Thatcher's over there somewhere, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think we can look at some of the women that were aligned with Trump and um, we can pretty clearly answer the, is the worst woman better than the best man? You know? Mm -mm. Yeah. So, but I think about, and you know, sometimes just, just stories and examples are, are, and here's one of them that comes to mind. Clan mothers talking about how they select the chiefs and, you know, have that responsibility to nominate them, hold them in office. I've heard it described as the, the, um, the clan mother is the eyes and ears of the people and the chief is the voice of the people. But the mm -hmm. voice has to listen to the eyes and ears in order to know what to say and that, that kind of balance. But, but um, you know, wh what do they look for in, in, in a chief? It's, as I understand it, it's, it's a little boy who is like really listening, who is a really good listener and who watches to see what other people need and, and who they know will look out for the seventh generation, who won't, who's not in it for himself 
you know, takes care of other people, is a good, uh, a good family man. Um, and I think that that thinking about um, about how we define gender and the 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 toxic quality of toxic masculinity hmm. combined with an idea that um, that it's how did Stanton say it it's it's every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost. You know, the idea that, that I'm going to get as much as I can and screw everybody else. Right. The, the difference of the, what do they talk about? The, the, the one bowl, one spoon. And nobody goes, nobody eats if everybody does. You know, it's like everybody has to eat. And nobody is going to take more than their fill, more than their share. Right. And that the kind of ideas, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, you know, it's 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 the few have no right to the luxuries of life, while the many are denied the necessities. Mm -hmm. And that's a very indigenous concept. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the process of of our not appropriating, but learning from a, an indigenous way of being in the world is the key to survival. If, mm -hmm. if I see the, what? If I see <laughs> the livestock that my dad used to raise, you know, if, if I see those as relatives rather than commodities, I mean, it's, you know, I, here's one of the practices that I try is that I think about, okay, I'm sitting in a circle and I'm looking across at my closest relative and it's corn. You know? Yeah. I think instead of this, if I think of this instead, you know, my friend Tilly Blackbear, one time she called her her grandson grandfather, and I said, Tilly, is there something I'm missing here? You know, what is this about? She said, first of all, you know, it's the Lakota humor. She says, well, um, <laughs> When when you get old, you go back to diapers. You lose your teeth. You, you know you're you're like you were when you were little. But then she said the real thing is that 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 we're spiritual beings on a physical journey, and those who are the most sacred are those who are coming into this journey, and those who are end, ending it, who are leaving it. And when I think about myself at 78 as, as being on a, a line, it's like, Oh shit, I'm getting near the end, you know? <laughs> but if I think about this, I understand the way in which I feel younger than I felt at 18. You know, I feel like I've shed so much of the shoulds and the, the niceties and who knows what, you know, it it's like there is a way you grow younger but but my world doesn't explain it my world tells me i'm heading to the dead end right oh i love it so great to catch up with you my friend so i try to keep these roughly about an hour so we're, we're hitting that mark but before we wrap up i just thought i I'd, I'd definitely be remiss if i didn't um let people know about, you know, uh, again, how we met on that Thursday morning roundtable. You were speaking about the Gage House. And so maybe we could wrap up on, on talking about how you discovered the Matilda Jocelyn Gage House, um, you know, what brought you here and, and what goes on there now and how people could, could check it out if they, you know, if they want to get oh. some more information. It, can you write in the chat room? Yeah, sure. I, I can put some sure. banners up. Yeah. MatildaJocelynCage.org. Like? Okay. 
Yeah, and people can check out our website. We have created an award-winning museum by breaking all the rules of museums. We invite people to sit on the furniture, eat and drink. This is all pre-COVID. We're having to rethink everything. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, um, what? Oh boy, where do I begin? We, one of the uniquenesses is that you know most historic houses. You go in and it's like, here's where they ate, here's where they slept, here's where they blah, blah, blah. And none of that. Right. Every room in the Gage house carries one of her social justice issues. First room in the house is Haudenosaunee. And that's your Onondaga territory. Um, she said, never was justice more perfect, never was civilization higher. This is where she got her vision. Women's rights room. The Oz parlor. She was this. She was the mother-in-law of L. Frank Baum. I and, know we, we could do a whole nother podcast. Seriously, there's so much crazy that. history there. And then the Underground Railroad Room. And she wrote about sex trafficking. And we talk about how you know enslavement is illegal everywhere in the world, but there are more enslaved people today than there have ever been because of trafficking. Cage wrote about it in 1893. And then the Religious Freedom Room, where you learn about this, you know, the whole thing we talked about with the the merger and the um, the Gage writing getting written out of history. So we're open now for scheduled tours, have to clean everything afterwards. But what we're doing is moving into a new, we're calling it Matilda 2.0. And we're going to bring her into the world and create a real digital presence for her. So we're doing what, you know, all businesses and nonprofits have to do right now, which is that we have to really rethink who we are and how do we survive and, and bring our message into the world in a post COVID world. Mm -hmm. So love to talk to people about it, to invite them to join us. Um, you know, get on the website and send me a note. Yeah. Oh, right. and I, the I L D A. Oh, I, I, I just I misspelled it. it. You spelled Jocelyn right, which nobody does. I know. I, I was right. It was. It was only the uh, the the speed of my uh, of of my uh, eagerness that. Uh, I think everybody would know that. Yeah, I just noticed it though. But there yeah. we go. There we go. Got Thank it. Got you. Yeah. So I, I can't, uh, you know, I've, I've stopped out to the house a few times and really just enjoyed my time out there. And I just love the work you're doing. I love everything about it. So I, I encourage everyone who's watching or listening to go check out uh, MatildaJocelynGage.com. That's J O S L. Org. Actually, it's a dot org. Sorry. Oh, dot org. Sorry. I had it right the first yeah. time. I keep messing it up. <laughs> No, I, I didn't pay good attention. But I, had it right, I had it right on the first one. I got it wrong on the second one. Gage.org. So, huh? Matilda Jocelyn Gage.org. Yes, there we go. Ah, thanks. Yeah, there we go. And, and please check it out and check out all the work that Sally's doing. It's really amazing. And she's got a, how many books? I mean, there's the, I, I, have, I have quite a few. Oh, you've, you've, I have a new one. Yeah, Actually, this was this was um, came out last year. Penguin yeah. Classics and uh, eh, Gloria Steinem, my friend, wrote the foreword to it. And this is an it's like the the original documents from the movement, and it's what you would not expect. Um, there's there's some fun stuff in there. And then this is my new book, just came out this fall. It's for young people. We want equal rights. And it's the story of the Haudenosaunee influence on women's rights. But nice, it nice. is, yeah, it's got fun pictures and good layout. Great. I love it. I love it. So so pick up some of Sally's books and stop out to the house. And uh, and also, uh, if, if you enjoy the podcast, please stop by uh, saltcitygrind.com. You can subscribe on Apple, YouTube, Spotify, all those places, and um, you know help support the work that we're doing, both of us. Sally, thank you so much for coming on. I deeply appreciate it. You're the best, and we should- uh, uh, Thank you, Joe. We'll do it again soon, yeah? Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> love it. Love it. Great to see uh, you. 
Great Thanks. to see you. Speak soon. Okay.